You know, many uh, consider the Pentecost event in the book of Acts as the birth of the church. And so it will be good for us to be reminded how it all got started and the impact those early Christians had. And hopefully, this would inspire us to seek that same Pentecostal power or Pentecost power to help us live effectively and meet the challenges we have today. You know, I look at it almost like a uh, cell phone that we have, you know, this cell phone. And, um, oops, I'm sorry, I have to receive this call. Hello? 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 I'm sorry, it's, it's low, but... <laughs> but you know what, friends? I really believe the Christian life is like that. No matter how expensive your cell phone is, no matter how high-tech your cell phone is, this is iPhone 16. <laughs> it's not yet in the market. I'm really advanced, you know. But friends, no matter how expensive or high-tech your cell phone is, if it is low but it's useless. Brothers and sisters, I believe it's the same with our Christian life. No matter how long you've been as a Christian, if you are low but you are useless. A Christian may be impressive looking on the outside. He may have seminary training. He knows a lot about the Bible. No matter how long you've been a Christian, if you are low but you won't be able to fulfill God's call for your life, and that is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is this, am I a fully charged Christian or a low but Christian? Or maybe the question is, how do we know if we are fully charged Christians? And so this morning, I'd like for us to study just one verse of Scripture, Acts 1.8, and I'd like for all of us to please stand and let's read this together. Just one verse. All together. Ready? Read. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's commit this time in prayer, shall we? Most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are dependent on how your Spirit will move in our midst. And so, Lord, we just ask, clear our minds of any concern, anything that will disturb our, our train of thought, so that we'll be sensitive to the voice of your Spirit. Cleanse us and cover us with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our prayer in his name. Amen and amen. You may take your seats. You know, here in the opening chapters of the book of Acts, we find Dr. Luke's account of the supernatural birth and the incredible growth of the church. Acts 1.15 informs us that there were 120 people to start with as charter members. And then in chapter 2, we learn that on the very first day of its existence, 3,000 more were added to the church in response to a single sermon from 120 to 3,120 in one day. And then chapter 2 ends with these words, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now soon, persecution erupted. Two of its leaders were arrested and put behind bars. But did this hinder their growth? Not a bit. By the time they checked their membership role in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, there were now 5,000 converts counting the men only. That means if we include the women and the children, there could be as many as 10,000 believers at CLC Jerusalem. <laughs> then in Acts chapters 5 and 6, we read that the church encountered not only persecutions from without, but also problems from within. But once they got the problem solved, Acts chapter 6 verse 7 tells us, So the word of God spread, the number of, his, of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so one commentator estimated that there could be as many as 20,000 converts by the time the church celebrated its second year anniversary. Wow! 20,000 in two years. 
such a rapid growth. Indeed, the church was not only born, it, it immediately began to impact the world in ways nobody would have imagined. And so we cannot help but ask, why was the early church so powerful? Why so much impact? How could they, ha they have accomplished so much in so short a time? I mean, they didn't have a church building, no air conditioning, no outside funding, no complex structure, no television or radio ministry, no seminary trained pastor. So what was it? Was the church immune to problems? Certainly not. Having the apostles as pastors didn't guarantee the absence of problems as those hungry widows of Acts chapter 6 would testify. Was it better environment? Certainly not. The fact is just the opposite was true. Opposition was so intense that Christians had to evacuate the city. Was it because those first Christians who gathered in that upper room were men and women with incredible faith? I mean, these were men and women with, who are strong natural leaders or maybe people who just had exceeding amount of courage. Would that explain it? Certainly not. On the contrary, what we have in that room was a handful of frightened Christians unsure of their future and unaware how Jesus' promise would be fulfilled. They were nothing but a plain, rugged bunch of ordinary people. In fact, in that group, we know a few by name as well as their track records. Peter, who had denied Christ, was there. Thomas, the doubter, was present. John and his brother James, who had wanted special seats in the kingdom, were there too. And then among them were the brothers and perhaps also the sisters of Jesus, who had scoffed at him and even thought that he was insane. All in all, it was a bunch of failing, often faithless people. There were no shining halos hovering over them, no clergy colors, no one carrying a doctoral diploma or a 10-page resume. Incredible, isn't it? None of the things we usually think are so essential for success today could explain the tremendous growth the early church had. Brothers and sisters, there's only one plausible explanation. Something happened to those disciples which brought about an amazing transformation. No, it wasn't a salary increase, though that would help. It was not positive thinking that changed them. It was not earning a degree or getting an ordination. They're all good. But friends, there's only one answer, and it's got to be Acts 1.8. And the first thing you will notice here when you look at that verse, you look at the first two words, but you. Who's the you? The people God empowers. You know, this you... They were not a special breed of men and women, that's for sure, but ordinary human beings just like the rest of us. But they believed in Jesus and obeyed him to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Friends, if not for the Holy Spirit empowering the disciples, those early Christians could have easily passed into history without making a dent on their first century world. And then notice the second thing in this verse. It says, will receive power. The power God endows. Now look at the word power. The original word here is dunamis, which means an inherent explosive power. Dunamis, of course, is where we got the English word dynamite. It's the exact word, the dunamis of God, the dynamite of God. Jesus promises here that you shall receive dynamite. You shall receive inherent power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, what makes a dynamic Christian? What makes a Christian fully charged? What causes people to have power in their lives and be effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ? Friends, there's no doubt about it. It is the power of the Holy Spirit which indwells the life of the believer. When the Holy Spirit is not only residing, but presiding in a believer's life, there is power. When the Holy Spirit is not only present, but preeminent in a believer's life, there is power. Friends, when the Holy Spirit takes over a life, something happens. 
When they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they were clothed with heavenly power. That power manifested itself in their remarkable preaching, the, the invincible courage, the unshakable confidence, and their mighty deeds. This, I believe, is the one irreducible minimum if we want to accomplish the mission God has given us. We need that power from on high. And then the third thing we notice in this verse, it says, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The person God entrusts is the third person of the Trinity, also called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. Now, many Christians are afraid when we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit, especially because it's also called the Holy Ghost. You know, the word ghost makes us nervous when especially he gets credited for some bizarre behavior that only increases our fear. But friends, if we remember what the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples about the Holy Spirit, this should give us comfort, not fear. Here's what he said in John 14, 16 to 18. Remember, this was the Last Supper setting. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to depart and leave them. And here's what Jesus Christ assured them. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another. Very interesting, the word another. There are two Greek words for another. There's heteros, which is another of a different kind. But then the second one that is used here is alos, another of the same kind. That means I'm going to ask the Father and He will give you another me. The same me. I'll give you, He will give you the helper, the comforter, the advocate to be with you forever. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, whenever you're afraid, especially when there are seemingly spiritual battle going on. Remember, the spirit who is in you is greater than the spirit who is in this world. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know, Jesus Christ talked about the spirit in John chapter 3 as like the wind. When there's the wind and you see the branches, you see it's moving, the, the leaves are moving, you attribute it, the wind is moving. Now, when the spirit is moving, you can see that, but the world doesn't recognize that. When something good happens, they just say, it's just good luck. No, no, no. They don't recognize it. It's the Holy Spirit moving. They do not know him. But you know him, he said, for he dwells in you. And then, here's the prophetic word. Here's the Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost event, and will be in you. And then Jesus Christ said, I will not leave you as orphans, even though he's moving back to the, to the heavens to sit at the right hand of the Father. And yet he said, I will come to you. How is that possible? He's already right there in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Friends, Jesus is now in us in the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit who anoints us, convicts us, cleanses us, and empowers us. We are commanded to be continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. How much power we experience depends on how yielded we are to the Spirit of God. Amen. And so, friends, the real question is this. How much do you long to experience the transforming power of the Holy Spirit? So we should not be afraid to ask the Father to seek more of the Spirit's supernatural presence in our lives in, in whatever way He might want to manifest Himself, which will always be edifying to us, glorifying to the Father, and it will always be consistent with what God says in His Word. As Jesus Himself assured us here in Luke eleven thirteen, if you then, who are evil, know how to good, give, give, good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. But now friends, if you look again on Acts chapter 1 verse 8, not only do we see here the people God empowers, the power God endows, and the person God entrusts, but even more importantly is the reason why God wants us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And here's what it says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then it says, and you will be my witnesses. Friends, the purpose God expounds, the very purpose why he wants us to be empowered with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, let me just complete the outline here. The last portion there, it says, In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the places God encompasses. But friends, I want to focus on number four, and that is the very reason, the very purpose, why you and I individually and as a church have been called to accomplish and that is to bear witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, the key, if we want to accomplish our mission, to be effective witnesses for the Lord is found here in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Because here we see the Holy Spirit empower those disciples to be powerful witnesses, to persevere under persecution, to demonstrate a boldness that amazed even their accusers. But now some of you might be saying right now, but Pastor Roy, these were the church leaders. I mean, these are the great apostles. These were the, the, the pillars of the church. Surely they have done all of these miraculous things. But how about the ordinary church members? Well, thank you for asking. If you turn to Acts chapter 8, here we'll see. That's the Holy Spirit again trying to uh, <laughs> impress upon you, you know, some of these things. If you turn to Acts chapter 8, here we'll see the, the fullness of the Spirit. It's not just for a select group of people. It's not just for the church leaders. It's the inheritance of all who are yielded to God. And so Acts chapter 8, the second half of verse 1, after the stoning of Stephen, it says here, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Now, take note of what it says here. All except, all except who? All except the full-time Christian workers, all except the pastors, the verses, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Of course, the word all here would refer to the, the laity, the ordinary church members that made up CLC Jerusalem. So what did these ordinary church members do when they got scattered? Jump to verse 4. It says there, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, that's interesting. God used the ordinary church members of CLC Jerusalem to spread the gospel. He kept the pastors at headquarters in Jerusalem, but he pushed beyond Judea and Samaria the ordinary Christians. Christians with no ordination, no title, no degrees, no, no clergy color. Just ordinary Christians who were yielded to God and filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I love that story that came out of England when they were running out of silver and they had nothing left for their coins. The crusty old Oliver Cromwell sent his soldiers to the cathedral to see if they could find any silver there. The soldiers came back and said, the only silver we could find is in the statues of the saints that are standing in the corners of the church. To which Cromwell replied, good, we'll melt down the saints and put them in circulation. Now, friends, that's not only good economy, that's good theology. That's where the saints belong, in circulation. They're out there spreading the gospel. They don't belong stuck in some corner of a church, gathering dust, getting their halos shined, or sitting up on a pedestal as if there's some big deal. No, they were saints yielded and filled with the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the key, if we want to accomplish our mission and become effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, is found here in Acts 1.8. So I want to focus now on this wonderful promise of witnessing power which Jesus left to his disciples. How is that power manifested? Or to answer our sermon title, how do you know if you're a fully, if you're a fully charged Christian? Well, the first thing we notice here in the biblical narrative is that when the Holy Spirit energizes a believer and becomes fully charged, the power of the Holy Spirit produces change. When a believer yields to the power of the Holy Spirit, this power produces change in his life. You know, your life is transformed when the Holy Spirit takes over your life. You are never the same person again. There is a change in your life that you can't even explain the change took place in the lives of the disciples when the Holy Spirit came upon them. For example, Peter. You know, he has a volatile temper. 
But finally, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, got hold of his temper. Thomas, who was a pessimist and would always stay on the dark side of things. You know, Thomas lives his life on the worst case scenario. Do you know the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? You'll know, it, the, you'll know the difference the moment they wake up in the morning. The optimist says, good morning, Lord. The pessimist says, good Lord, morning. But you know, Thomas was finally cured of his pessimism and realized that with the Lord, you can actually choose to stay on the bright side of things. Yes, you can actually choose to get over your depression, leave it to God, allow God to move in your heart, to correct your mind. Yes, fully charged Christians will change the way they talk. It will change the way they think. The way they behave, the way they dress. Why? Because their value system has changed. Their standards of morality has changed. Their priorities in life has changed. If I may ask you this, this morning, not to embarrass you, has there been a change in your life since you came to know the Lord? Is there a change in your life since you surrendered your life to Jesus? Now, I'm not asking if you are everything you ought to be right now. But I'm asking, is there any change in your life ever since? As the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Now, you may not be all you ought to be today, but if Christ is already in your life and the Holy Spirit is in control, friends, there should be a distinct difference in your life. And that is the power of our witness through the change of our lives with the Holy Spirit Produces. You know, I recognize that one of the problems we have in witnessing is the problem of inconsistency. Do you know why some Christians find it hard to share their faith with others? It's because their lives are not consistent with what they profess. Amen. In fact, when you share your faith with a classmate, your classmate says, I didn't know you're a Christian. <laughs> you know, they're more surprised and shocked. Really? You go to church? Wow. You know, because of that inconsistency with what we say and how we live. In 1 John 3 verse 9 in the Living Bible, it says, The person who has been born into God's family does not make a practice of sinning because now God's life is in him, so he can't keep on sinning for this new life has been born into him and controls him and he has been born again. You know, sometimes we speak of a worldly Christian. But you know, according to the Apostle John, that's an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. The same way it doesn't make sense when you speak of a heavenly devil. What John is telling us here is that many of those we are calling worldly Christians may not actually be Christians after all. You see, when you see a bird that looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it eats like a duck, then you are left with an inevitable conclusion that what you're looking at is actually a duck. Now, if I see a person who claims to be a Christian and yet he or she acts like the world, talks like the world, laughs like the world, lives like the world, dresses up like the world, loves the world, then friends, I am driven to certain inevitable conclusion. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that worldliness is one of the greatest hindrances to our witness today. It robs us of our spiritual effectiveness. It ruins our witness for the Lord. As 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. And then verse 16, it says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. When a Christian is fully charged, you can know it, because there's a change in the way they live, in the way they act, the way they react to situations in life that make them an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, all of us here are witnesses. Every one of us here this morning, we are all witnesses. The only question is, are you a good witness or a bad one? 
You see, you and I can know that we're fully charged Christians when we see those changes. So why not take a personal inventory of your life? What changes have you seen since you became born again? In the way you act or react? Do people at your work or place and, and school notice this? What addictions have you overcome? May it be alcohol or nicotine? Maybe the movies you watch or the books you read or the websites you visit? And what's your favorite swear word? What's your favorite swear word? Come on, you don't have to answer out loud, but you can know that in your mind. What's your favorite swear word? What makes you laugh? What are the thoughts that you allow your minds to entertain? In other words, friends, is my lifestyle promoting the gospel or is it a hindrance to the furtherance of the gospel? You know, people may not be reading their Bibles, but I can assure you they are reading you. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day by deeds that you do, by words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true, say what is the gospel according to you. Brothers and sisters, you and I can know if we are fully charged Christians because the power of the Holy Spirit produces chains. Now, secondly, the power of the Holy Spirit provides courage. You know, one of the realities you will discover as you go through the book of Acts is the unusual courage in the lives of those disciples. There was that boldness that was not present before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. You know, there is one factor that keeps us from being the witnesses we ought to be more than anything else. It's fear. We don't want to be ostracized. So not only do we have the problem of inconsistency, but we also have the problem of intimidation. You know, a lot of times, that's what's keeping us from sharing our faith. You see, it takes a lot of courage to look at a person in the eye and then tell that person what Jesus Christ did for you and tell him what God can do for him. Some people are just too afraid to share their faith with others. But friends, you know you're fully charged with the Holy Spirit when you have that incredible courage to stand up for what is right and share the truth out of love. When the Holy Spirit energizes us and we submit to him, Jesus Christ made a promise. Look at this promise in Matthew chapter 10, 18 to 20. Jesus said, on, account of my, on, on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. You know what Jesus Christ is telling us here? Is that if we only yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God, obey the command of Jesus to be a witness for Him, and then open our mouth, the Lord will witness through us, and we will be absolutely astounded at some of the things that will come out of our mouths, and the things that we can do when we overflow in the Spirit. You know, this reminds me, of the true story Chuck Swindle related in one of his books. It's a moving story of how the Holy Spirit can turn a tragedy into a witnessing opportunity when we allow him to take control. It's the story of a seminary student who one summer break was looking for a significant ministry that would help him raise some funds for his tuition in the fall. He asked God for a position to open up at some church staff or church organization, but nothing happened. Days turned into weeks, still nothing. He finally faced reality. He needed any job he could find. He checked the job advertisements, and the only thing that seemed to be a possibility was driving a bus in Southside Chicago. Nothing to brag about, but it would help with his tuition. After learning the route, he was on his own, a rookie driver in a dangerous section of the city. It wasn't long before he realized just how dangerous his job really was. A small gang of tough kids spotted the young driver and began to take advantage of him. Now, these are not the actual pictures. I just took them from the internet <laughs> just to help you visualize things. For several mornings in a row, 
they got on, walked right past him without paying, ignored his warnings, and rode until they decided to get off, all the while making smart remarks to him and others in the bus. Finally, he decided that this had gone on long enough. The next morning, after the gang got on as usual, the driver saw a policeman on the next corner. He pulled over and reported the offense. The officer told them to pay or to get off. They paid. But unfortunately, the policeman got off and they stayed on. When the bus turned another corner or two, the gang assaulted the young driver. When he regained consciousness, blood was all over his shirt, two teeth were missing, both eyes were swollen, his money was gone, and the bus was empty. After returning to the terminal and being given the weekend off, our friend went to his little apartment, sunk onto his bed, and stared at the ceiling in disbelief. Resentful thoughts warmed his mind. Confusion, anger, and disillusionment added fuel to the fire of his physical pain. He spent a fitful night wrestling with the Lord. How can this be? Where's God in all of this? I genuinely want to serve him. I prayed for a ministry. I was willing to serve him anywhere, doing anything. And this is the things I got. On Monday morning, he decided to press charges. With the help of the officer who had encountered the gang and several who were willing to testify as witnesses against the gang, most of them were rounded up and taken to the local county jail. Within a few days, there was a hearing before the judge. Inside the courtroom, as the angry gang members glared across the room in his direction, suddenly he was seized with a whole new series of thoughts. Not bitter ones, but compassionate ones. His heart went out to the guys who had attacked him. Under the Spirit's control, he no longer hated them. He pitied them. They needed help, not more hate. But what could he do? Suddenly, after there had been a plea of guilty, the guy under the power of the Holy Spirit courageously stood to his feet and requested permission to speak to the surprise of his attorney and everybody else in the courtroom. He said, Your Honor, I would like you to total up all the days of punishment against these men, all the time sentenced against them, and I request that you allow me to go to jail in their place. The judge didn't know whether to spit or wind his watch. Both attorneys were stunned as the guy, fully charged with the Holy Spirit, looked over at the gang members and said quietly, it's because I forgive you. The dumbfounded judge, when he reached a level of composure, said rather firmly, young man, you're out of order. This sort of thing has never been done before. To which the young man replied with spirit-inspired insight, oh yes, it has your honor. Yes, it has. It happened 2,000 years ago when a man from Galilee paid the penalty that all mankind deserve. And then for the next three or four minutes without interruption, he explained how Jesus Christ died on our behalf, thereby proving God's love and forgiveness. He was not granted his request. But the young man visited the gang members in jail and led most of them to faith in Jesus Christ. And he began a significant ministry to many others in Southside Chicago. True story. This is what we see in the book of Acts. The disciples were energized with the Spirit. They were fully charged to persevere under persecution, to endure and just suffering with forgiving attitude. It turned their fearful reluctance into bold confidence. That's how they made a difference. That's how they turned the world upside down. Or actually, it's to turn the world right side up. So what's preventing us from experiencing the same I can almost hear some of you now saying, oh, well, pastor, things have changed since then. No, 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 no. Don't you believe that even for a second? You see, friends, the same master who commissioned those disciples is the same master who commissions us today. Our master has not changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not getting old. He is not sick. He has the same power he had in the first century than Today, the first 21st century, not only has our master not changed, but also the mandate has not changed. The Lord Jesus has never withdrawn or updated the Great Commission. The same commission 
The same mandate, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, is just as powerful, just as real today at, as it has ever been. As our master has not changed, our mandate has not changed, our message has not changed. We don't need a modern gospel for the modern man. Friends, if it's new, it's not true. The Bible makes it clear here in Jude 3, we are to earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered for the saints. But you say, oh yes, Pastor Roy, our master has not changed, our mandate has not changed, our message has not changed, but Pastor let me tell you, something has changed. Mankind has changed. Men are so hard today. People are so wicked today. Men are so sinful today. Friends, I want to tell you something. Adam was totally depraved. He was totally sinful. And you can't get worse than that. God never had but sinners to work with. You see, it's an insult to God to say that we can make a difference today. It's a lie from the pit of hell to say that Pentecost power is no longer available to us today. Brothers and sisters, God has empowered us through the Holy Spirit to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, and lift up the fallen to tell them that Jesus is mighty to save. Friends, there has never been a greater day with a greater need to preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ than our day, than our age. So let's not allow the devil to intimidate us with fear. The devil wants you to be afraid. But you can choose not to. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, fully charged with the Holy Spirit, you don't go out powerless in a powerless condition. When you walk in as a born-again child, you have dynamite within you. When you go to work tomorrow, there is dynamite within you. When you go to school tomorrow, there is dynamite within you. When, when you go to your neighborhood, there is dynamite within you. The power of the Holy Spirit puts that courage into our lives. You see, I think the kind of people, I mean, think of the kind of people God used. When you read the Bible, are these incredible men and women that we can see in our Bibles who have been mightily used by God? I'm sorry, but... They're not that incredible. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, consider Noah. He was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. I'm not so sure about that being ugly. Maybe it's only because she was compared to her sister Le Rachel. Just because of the comparison. You know, beauty and ugliness is all relative. It depends on who are you comparing yourself to. So you can thank your friends that you're beautiful because of them. <laughs> but you see, Joseph was abused. Moses couldn't talk. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Wow, I have never tried that. I won't. <laughs> Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied Christ. Thomas doubted Christ. And then we have in the New Testament, Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too self-righteous. And then we have Timothy had, had, had an ulcer. Lazarus was even dead, and God still used him. Friends, there's no more excuses. But I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're saying, Pastor Roy, I'm not educated enough. My English is not good enough. I don't know the Bible enough. I'm not that old enough. I don't look good enough. I mean... Not look good enough. Can you imagine if God can only use handsome pastors? <laughs> what will happen to me? What will happen to Pastor Paul? What will happen to Pastor Jerry? Are we the only three pastors God can use? Come on. Give us a break. But not really, friends. 
let me show you God's standards if he wants to use somebody in the ministry. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and this, the despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Amen. Now, do you really believe that verse? If you believe that verse, that means even though you're not wise by human standards, you're just a high school graduate, God can use you. That means you believe that even though you're not influential, just a domestic helper, God can use you. That means you believe that even though you're not of a noble birth, you're just a prom D from the province. God can use you. you got to believe it, friends. God chose you to shame the wise. God chose you to shame the strong. you got to believe it because that's what the Word of God says. And that's why I love the response of that woman who when she was asked, what's your occupation? And she said, I'm a missionary of Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised as a caregiver. Brothers and sisters, you and I can know that we're fully charged with the Holy Spirit because He puts courage into our hearts. Yes, the power of the Holy Spirit produces change. The power of the Holy Spirit provides courage. But then thirdly and lastly, the power of the Holy Spirit promotes compassion. Brothers and sisters, the reason I believe many Christians today are not making so much impact it's because of our failure to view people the same way Jesus views them. Jesus looks at people, at people who are lost, harassed, and helpless, like sheep without shepherd. We look at people by the car they drive, the signature clothes they have, the color of their skin, their height, Friends, if we truly want to make a difference in the lives of people, we need to have that compassion on people. You know, it's sad sometimes we view people only as statistics to be printed on a church bulletin to impress people that were growing. Others see people only as an audience to be entertained. Some preachers need people for their applause. And still others, people are viewed as cash registers or ATM machines that would cough out cash if you just push the right buttons. If those views are not bad enough, very sadly, some people view others simply as a pain in the neck. You know, the VIPs. You know what's a VIP? Very inconvenient people. <laughs> no wonder many Christians don't make a dent in the lives of people today. You see, we must truly love people if we are going to witness to them effectively for the Lord. So for many Christians, the problem is not so much that they're afraid to share, but that they just don't care. The problem of inconsistency, the problem of intimidation, but then thirdly, and I believe this is the biggest problem of all, and that's the problem of indifference. The problem of indifference. It's the attitude that says, I don't care if people go to hell. You know, I'm already busy enough. I don't want to get involved in someone else's life. I have my own problems. It's not my gift to share my faith. That's the reason why I'm giving tithes and offerings, so that the pastor will do this. So that I don't have to share the gospel. It's the pastor's job to evangelize. My faith is private, and I don't want to impose it on people. Anyways, if God really wants to save them, they'll get saved by and by. They don't need me. God can use someone else. Friends, in one word, that's indifference. The bottom line is, I don't care if people go to hell. Friends, you and I can know that we're fully charged Christians when we have compassion for the lost. A spirit-filled Christian is a witnessing Christian. As Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. It's not an option. You will be my witnesses. 
That means when you and I are fully charged, the power just flows from us to reach out to others with the deep compassion for the lost. And we need to have this compassion to get involved, the commitment to serve to the point of personal sacrifice. In closing, let me just close with this true story of Doug Nichols. He was the former head of the Christian mission known as Action International Ministries. In 1967, Doug was serving as missionary in India. When he contracted tuberculosis, he was eventually sent to a sanitarium to recuperate. While he was hospitalized, Doug tried unsuccessfully to reach out to reach some of the patients, but his efforts were generally rejected. When he offered gospel literature or gospel of John, he was politely refused. It was obvious that the patients wanted nothing to do with him or his God. Discouragement set in and Doug began to wonder why God had allowed him to be there anyway. God, Doug, would often be awakened in, in the night by the rasping sound of coughing, both his and others. But then what would you expect in the TB ward of a sanitarium? Unable to sleep because of his raspy cough early one morning, Doug noticed an old man trying to sit on the edge of the bed, but because of weakness, he would fall back. Exhausted, the old man finally lay still and sobbed. Later that morning, the stench that began to permeate the ward certified the obvious. The old man has been unsuccessfully trying to get up to get to the restroom. Says Doug, the nurses were extremely agitated and angry because they had to clean up the mess. One of the nurses in her anger even slapped him. The man, terribly embarrassed, just curled up into a ball and wept. The next morning, about 2 a.m., Doug noticed the old man was again trying to generate enough strength to get him out of bed, to go to the washroom. This time, though, without thinking, Doug got out of bed, went over to where the old man was, put one arm under his head and neck and the other under his legs, and then gently carried him to the restroom. When he had finished, Doug carried him back to his bed. But what happened after that is what makes the story. The old man speaking in a language Doug didn't understand, thanked him pure, profusely. Eventually, Doug drifted off to an uneasy sleep. In the morning, he awakened to a steaming hot of tea, a steaming cup of tea, served to him by another patient who spoke no English. After the patient served the tea, he made motions indicating that he wanted one of Doug's gospel tracts. And throughout the day, says Doug, People came to me asking for the gospel booklets. This included the nurses, the hospital interns, the doctors, until everyone in the hospital had a gospel literature booklet or gospel of John. Over the next few days, he adds, several indicated they trusted Christ as Savior as a result of reading the good news. Friends, what's the lesson? The world doesn't care how much we know, but they want to know how much we care. Friends, the power of the Holy Spirit produces change. The power of the Holy Spirit provides courage. The power of the Holy Spirit promotes compassion. And so the question each of us need to ask ourselves this morning is this. What evidence of the Spirit's transforming power can people see in my life? Do I experience His anointing power in my life and in my ministry? Am I walking daily and ministering in the fullness of the Spirit? Because friends, a fully charged Christian means you are a person whose life is in harmony with the Lord. What is important to Him is important to you. What burdens Him burdens you. You are sensitive to the things of God. There are no closets that are locked. That means you are grieved over sin. You are concerned about the things that displeases you. When He says go to the right, you go to the right. When He says stop that in your life, you stop it. When he says, this is wrong and I want you to change, you deal with it. You come to terms with it quickly. Why? Because you know God's Spirit is within you and He has empowered you to demolish strongholds in your life. Yes. 
the stronghold of sinful addiction, the stronghold of lust and immorality, the stronghold of hatred and bitterness, the stronghold of pride and deception, the stronghold of self-pity and depression. In Jesus' name, we can abolish these strongholds. And so, brothers and sisters, the only question as we are asking in this sermon, are you a fully charged Christian? You can be a fully charged Christian. You can ask the Father right now by claiming Luke eleven thirteen. how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Let's all stand, shall we? I'm not going to pray right now, but I want you to pray right now. Just raise your hands before God. If you truly seek His Spirit, just ask the Father. Ask the Father and He will give you that Holy Spirit in whatever manifestations God wants to use in your life to strengthen you, to, to establish you so you can be in a weak and effective witness for Him. Just shout out to God and just call on Him right now. Oh, Heavenly Father, hear the prayers of your people. Oh, Father God, Lord, we're tired of just coasting along. Lord, we're tired of mediocrity. Lord, we're tired of just going through the motions of religious life. Lord, we want our lives to make a difference. We want our lives to make a dent in our world. Oh, Father God, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Empower us with your spirit, Heavenly Father. Remove these strongholds in our lives, Father God. Oh, Father God, Lord, we're tired of being victims. We are victors in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we just claim that victory right now. We claim that power right now. Lord, we cover that sin with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus right now. And Father God, Lord, release us. Release us to the fullness of your spirit that it will make a difference in the way we live today and the way we minister today. Oh, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord.